Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to Time of Worship on the Sunday after Christmas. And so glad that you are here in person and online. We are just happy to be together and worship on this, on this beautiful Sunday morning. So welcome to everybody. I have a few things that I just want to go over a little bit this morning. Um, Christmas Eve was great. Even with trying to change times with rain and not rain, inside or outside, um, we had a wonderful Christmas Eve, and that takes a lot of people. And so I want to say a special thanks to, to Dave and Katie for the music. It was wonderful. Um, for our tech team, uh, I make sure I've got everybody. Alan and Gary and Marilyn um, took care of that. They keep us going, and uh, we couldn't do it without all the behind-the-scenes people. So many, many thanks to everybody for making Christmas Eve just so Wonderful time to worship Christ. So next week, we have a special time of uh, communion and then also of rededicating our life as we begin a new year, recommitting ourselves, what it means to be a Christian. And so for all of you online, I would like to just remind you to have bread and juice available so to share in communion with us and just to become with a heart open to what it means to dedicate yourself to follow, being a Christ follower. This week, today in worship, we have a very special time. Um, as you know, there are uh, at all the colleges, there are Wesley Foundations. They are groups of kids that are together, and we are just uh, Methodist hearts. And so we... Um, Part of our apportionment goes to supporting these Wesley Foundations at each of the colleges around the state. And so today, we have a special time of being able to hear from our, our Wesley, our college students. They have put together a special time. They will be participating by doing the reading and giving us a message. And, and it, I hope that you will just really open your heart to hearing what our young people are saying. And it's a great time to be reminded that Christ is really at work through our colleges, campuses. It's a great thing. Our offering, our loose offering today here in the uh, church will go toward the Wesley Foundations and um, to help support the ministries at the, at the colleges throughout uh, the state. And um, I do want to lift up one prayer request to you. Jane Lagner is in the hospital and will be having surgery this week, so we don't know the time or date exactly, but if you will keep her in your prayers, uh, uh, Jane Lagner, that would be great. So I am so glad that we are together for this special time of worship, and uh, let us open our hearts and say, come Holy Spirit. Good morning. Merry Christmas. Uh, I was going to originally do a, a song called... Um, Oh, what a glorious night. But after what happened on Christmas Day, um, I just thought we needed to sing about peace a little bit. Um, and, you know, no matter what happens, um, there's no reason to be afraid because God is always with us. And he proved that on Christmas Day. So this song is called Glory, Let There Be Peace. written by Matt Mayer. One star burns in the darkness, shines with a promise, Emmanuel. One child born in the stillness, living within us, Emmanuel. Singing glory. Let there be peace, let there be peace. We're singing glory, glory. Let there be peace, let it start with me. One voice speaks for the voiceless, hopes for the hopeless, Emmanuel. One love 
brings us together now and forever. Emmanuel, singing glory, glory. Let there be peace. Let there be peace. We're singing glory, glory. Let there be peace. Let it start with me. Do not be afraid. His love is strong enough to save us. Nothing stands in the way. His love is strong enough to lead us. Do not be afraid. His love is strong enough to save us. Nothing stands in the way. His love is strong enough to lead us. Singing glory, glory, that there be peace. Let there be peace, we're singing glory, glory. Let there be peace, let it start with me. We're singing glory, glory. Let there be peace, let there be peace. We're singing glory, glory. Oh, let there be peace, let it start with me. Let there be peace, let it start with me. Good morning, I'm Melissa Hernandez from Wesley at UCF, and today's reading on this first Sunday comes from Luke 2, 22 through 40. Then it was time for their purification offering as required by the law of Moses after the birth of a child. So his parents took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. The law of the Lord says, if a woman's first child is a boy, he must be dedicated to the Lord. So they offered the sacrifice required in the law of the Lord, either a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. At that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simon. He was righteous and devout and was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him and had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That day the Spirit led him to the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord, as the law required, Simon was there. He took the child in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace, as you promised. I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God to all nations, and he is the glory to your people, Israel. Jesus' parents were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simon blessed them, and he said to Mary, the baby's mother, This child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall and many others to rise. He has sent him as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. As a result, the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your very soul. Anna, a prophet, was also there in the temple. She was a daughter of Phanuel from the tribe of Asher, and she was very old. Her husband died when they had been married only seven years. She lived as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but stayed there day and night, worshiping God and fasting with prayer. She came along just as Simon was talking with Mary and Joseph. She began praising God. She talked about the child to everyone who had been waiting expectantly for the God to rescue Jerusalem. When Jesus' parents had fulfilled all the requirements of the law of the Lord, they returned home to Nazareth and Galilee. There the child grew up healthy and strong, and he was filled with wisdom, and God's favor was on him. Save 
sons and daughters Did you know that your baby boy Has come to make us new This child that you've delivered Side to a blind man, Mary. Did you know that your baby boy will come a storm in his hand? Did you know that your baby boy has walked where angels trod? When you kiss your the face of God oh Mary did you know oh Mary did you know was heaven's perfect lamb Oh, the sleeping child you're holding is the great arm. The great I am and Now would you join me in prayer? Gracious God, we come to you. Thank you for this moment that you've given us. To meet somehow separate from one another, but together in spirit. We love you and we thank you for this time. We thank you for one another and the fact that you have woven each of us into the same fabric of faith. We ask that during this time you would just give us the courage, give us the patience, give us the fortitude to follow you where you lead us, Lord in both the times where we can celebrate life and those times that are maybe a little more scary. We ask that during this season you would create in us a spirit that would be so attractive to other people that they would want to know why we are the way we are and who you are because of it. We ask that you would give us opportunities to bless those around us through our actions, through our words, through our practical deeds of kindness and grace and mercy. Lord, you are such a good and loving God, and we want the world to see that. We want the world to know you as we know you, but we also want to know you more. So during this time, reveal yourself to us in fresh and new ways. Help us to see and understand you. Help us to embrace the mystery of things that we can't understand, all the while knowing that you are there and that you are here with us. We love you and we thank you for this moment. 
We thank you for the family of faith that you've created and the tribe of us that gathered today. And we thank you for the prayer your son taught us to say, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We do remember in our blessing that the loose offering will be going to the Wesley Foundation, the college kids, and um, who just have that spark for Christ. And isn't that what we're all about, is spreading the word, especially with our young people. So um, we pray a blessing for that. And also... All, the, all of you have been so dedicated in, in supporting the ministries of this church. We want to thank you for that during this time. So would you pray with me? Our oh Lord, we thank you so much for this, off, this opportunity to give back to you, to support your young people and the way that you are just growing in their hearts. And we thank you for this church, the ministries that, that are happening here and that the opportunities that are in front of us as we head into a new year. So pray your blessing upon these offerings, on the givers who give so generously with their open hearts. And we pray that we can be your hands and feet in this world, Lord, can truly share the difference that Jesus makes. Amen. The message this morning is brought to us by a student named Flower Hughes at Campus to City Wesley. Uh, and their text for this morning comes out of the first chapter of John. Now, I'll be reading this, this famous passage uh, out of a, a newer translation called the Common English Bible. Here now a reading of John's Gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was with God in the beginning. Everything came into being through the word, and without the word, nothing came into being. What came into being through the word was life, and the life was the light for all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness doesn't extinguish the light. The true light that shines on all people was coming into the world. The light was in the world, and the world came into being through the light, but the world didn't recognize the light. The light came to his own people, and his own people didn't welcome him. But those who did welcome him, those who believed in his name, he authorized to become God's children, born not from blood, nor from human desire or passion, but born from God. The word became flesh and made his home among us. We have seen his glory, glory like that of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Hey everyone, my name is Flower Hughes. I am a student at Campus to City Wesley here in Jacksonville, Florida, and I am so, so, so excited to be bringing the message today. I really um, feel like COVID has taken a lot from us. But then there are also these incredible opportunities that have arisen because we are all remote. And so getting to be in so many places at once is pretty amazing and, and really a, a testament to modern technology. Uh, let me give you a little bit of background on who exactly I am. I am a fellow at Campus to City Wesley. Um, basically, I, I do kind of odd jobs as well as um, some ministry initiatives here at, at CCW. Um, if you don't know about CCW, we are located in Northeast Florida. We serve kind of the Jacksonville, St. Augustine area. Um, our campuses include uh, Jacksonville University, uh, Edward Waters College, University of North Florida, which is where I go, and a couple of other ones, including St. John's River State College and Florida State College at Jacksonville. I. Um, I'm currently a student at UNF. I'm in my senior year. I study public health and American Sign Language. 
Uh, I've been a part of CCW since my freshman year at UNF, and through my involvement, I have kind of explored a call to ministry. And after I graduate from UNF, I intend to attend seminary and earn a master's in divinity. Um, hopefully going on to full-time ministry in the UMC. I'm a cat mom of two, and I live with my mom, who is my best friend. In addition to my passion for ministry, I also love art and cooking, and I've taken full advantage of the whole theme of quarantine baking. Um, I'm just really, really excited to be here, and I feel really fortunate to bring this message. So we're talking about John 1, a couple verses from John 1 today. Um, and as we've moved through the Christmas season, I feel like we've been thinking a lot about birth, and that's really what I want to focus on today. This whole idea of the Word becoming flesh, and like that transition point from God to baby. As a 23-year-old, I am surrounded by birth all the time. While I am not having children anytime soon, I'm sorry to my extended relatives, you probably are wondering when I'm going to settle down and have kids, uh, not anytime soon. Um, I'm still surrounded by people my age getting married, and having children, and even at the beginning of, the, of 2020, our assist, uh, associate director gave birth to her second child. So I feel like this year has weirdly been shrouded in birth for me. And all this birth really does make me think about Jesus' birth. You know, what was it like? Uh, was Mary's labor really hard? or was giving birth to the divine easy. We believe that Mary was somewhere between 12 and 16 years old when she gave birth to, Mary, to Jesus, and honestly, the odds were not in her favor. As somebody who studies public health, one of the biggest measurements of the health of a society is infant and maternal mortality. And in the first century, the odds were not good. While it's hard to pin down exactly what the rates were, we can estimate that Mary faced some of the same challenges and barriers and worries and risks that people in the developing world face today. Many, many mothers Mary's age in Mary's time would not survive childbirth, and many more children wouldn't survive to their first birthday. I wonder if Mary thought about this as she was carrying Jesus and as she gave birth, wondering if her life would be cut short by bringing this new one into the world. While we generally think of birth as the beginning of life, it is surprisingly fraught with death. As I hold this idea of Mary in labor and Jesus' birth, I also think of my cousin who recently gave birth to her first son who, due to a congenital disease, died shortly after he was born. I think about my friend from high school who recently posted on Instagram that she was expecting her first child, only to post three days later that she had had a miscarriage and lost the pregnancy. I think about all the motherless children and the childless mothers who have lost their loved ones due to COVID-19 I think about all of the mothers going through their prenatal appointments alone and giving birth in empty birthing wards because having visitors is a health risk. I think about everyone who wonders now, what kind of world are our children growing up in or going to grow up in? I hold all of these thoughts alongside the Christmas story and I wonder, why? Why did God have to become a baby? To save the world? I think God was sending us a message here that this world matters. Mary's birthing pain matters. My cousin's son matters. My friend's grief matters. The loss from COVID-19 matters. All those laboring alone matter. Our children matter. Jesus was born, he lived, and he died because our births, our lives, our deaths matter to God. But Jesus also came with a promise that resurrection is as real for us as it was for him. 
Moving into the scripture today from John 1, verse 14 speaks of Jesus' birth, essentially prophesying when the Word becomes flesh. It says, The Word became flesh and made his home among us. John 1 tells us a lot of things about this Word, that this Word was both with God and was God in the beginning, that everything was made through this Word, and that this Word would become flesh to bring light and life to the world. To visualize this in preparation, I actually made a flowchart that talked about every single interconnection of the Word and life and flesh in these verses. But in addition to being enough of a nerd to make a flowchart about Bible verses, I'm also a huge biology enthusiast. And when we think about human birth, and human pregnancy, it's absolutely insane. The fact that humans make other humans by growing them inside our internal organs is entirely preposterous to me. The other fact that doesn't really make sense when we think about these broader trends of biology is exactly how helpless human babies are. Sure, some animals, like kittens for an example, are born with their eyes closed and don't open them until many weeks into their life. And hatchling birds are entirely featherless and can't regulate their own body temperature. But when we think about humans, we can't even lift our own heads. Our bones are not fully developed. Most of it is cartilage that will eventually become bone later in our life. Our skin is thin and sensitive, and our immune systems are practically non-existent. The only protection we get is from our mother's immune system, which will fade over time. The only thing that we have on kittens is that we can poop on our own. We are completely helpless as infants. So why did God arrive? to save the world as this helpless, squishy, vulnerable child. I really think that God was just showing God's nature. Over and over again in the Bible, we are told stories of the underdog, the forgotten, the seemingly useless, being lifted to glory. David, a young shepherd boy, becomes a war hero and a king. Moses, a child of the in-between, not quite an Egyptian, not quite an Israelite, becomes the liberator of the Jewish people. Rahab, a prostitute, becomes a paragon of virtue for sheltering the spies of Israel in the Promised Land. The story of Jesus being a lowly and helpless baby is not a deviation from the stories that we've been told about God. Instead, it is right in line with the message that God brings to us, that speaks to our lowliness, that speaks to our helplessness, and meets us in those low and helpless places. I'm currently studying public health at the University of North Florida, and wow, 2020 has been quite the year to be studying such a topic. I often tell people that I know just enough to understand how bad the pandemic is, but not enough to actually help anyone. I feel totally helpless. And utter helplessness is not a unique feeling to me in this year. We're trying to stay home and wear our masks and wash our hands and social distance as much as we possibly can, but no individual can stop a deadly virus. We're like infants in this world of pandemic, unable to even lift our own heads. God is not only for us in those times, but God is actually with us because God came to earth and became as helpless as we are. God chose to become that helpless as an infant. So when we ask, what is the significance of the incarnation of God as a human being, we have to think back to how helpless God was in the form of a baby. There was nothing that God could do to take care of God's self in that moment. Of course, some sort of divine intervention I'm sure could be used, but I really believe that God chose to be in that helpless position to show how much 
God wants to meet us where we are. God is telling us that our births, our lives, and our deaths matter to God. And in the person of Jesus, we are also given this promise that our life isn't just this three-part act, but our lives will actually follow the same pattern that Jesus did. Jesus was born, Jesus lived, Jesus died, and Jesus resurrected. And just as Jesus did, we have the promise that we will live again. So in these times where we are helpless and vulnerable and fearful, I encourage us all to remember the tiny baby who was born from a teenage mother in probably a cold, dirty, smelly barn that was the savior of the world. And if that savior could be that helpless in those moments, that message to us is that there is a next step from our helplessness. We don't live here. We don't live in this time of pain and helplessness. This is temporary. And we have a new promise that our lives are not just birth, life, death, but there is a fourth part, that resurrection in the person of Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for hearing my message today. God bless.
Hi, my name is Daniela Conde and I'm a sophomore at UF studying Communication Sciences and Disorders. Hi, my name is Alex Joyner and I am a sophomore at UF studying Marketing. Hello, my name is Heather Pancoast and I am one of the co-directors here at the Gator Wesley Foundation, the campus ministry at UF in Santa Fe. I am part of the leadership team at Gator Wesley. I currently serve as a residential staff member at Gator Wesley. Obviously, this has been a very different fall for all of us in the campus ministry world, like in the local church. We have really need to adjust and be creative with how we lived out our mission. On behalf of Gator Wesley and all of the United Methodist Campus Ministries, we would like to thank Bishop Carter for the invitation to share and worship with you today, and also thank each of you for joining us in this worship experience. It has been a blessing and honor to work together across the campus ministries and with our students to prepare this for you. We are so thankful for the prayers and encouragement of our alumni, local churches, families, and the conference who have supported us in our ministry to college students. We literally could not do this vital work without you. Thank you from all of us here for all that you do to support the United Methodist Campus Ministries across the Florida Conference. Although we serve different campuses and cheer for different football teams, we share the same mission of loving students in the name of Jesus, creating community where everyone can be welcomed and find a home, and walking alongside of students as they discern their calling from God. I am so thankful to have found a home and genuine community at Gator Wesley. Each of our campus ministries see themselves as an extension of the work that you do in the lives of young people in the local church. We are your campus ministries, and we are so blessed to be in partnership with our local churches. Thank you again for taking the time to worship with us, and, and we, we hope, hope that you, you have, have a Merry very Christmas. Merry Christmas. Am I on? Okay. I hope you felt the, the spirit working through those kids. And that's our apportionments at work. Sometimes we as 
little churches, you know, away from everything. We wonder where the young people are. Well, you got a taste and how active they are and how the Holy Spirit is working in the lives of them. And so I thank you for supporting the ministry so that we can support them. Just as it said in the last song, God is with us. We are not alone, and that is the victory, isn't it? That is the victory over any hopelessness, helplessness that, that we may feel, is that God has come to walk with us, to be with us, in us. And now our challenge is, what do we do with that? And how do we go forward? So as you prepare to leave, remember that Christ is with you. Christ is in you. And Christ is calling you to move ahead, to share the love that many people do not know, and to make a difference in the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, go forth and share that light. Amen. <laughs>